You wanna come and look, be on the camera? Okay, Holly has decided not to be on the camera. Welcome to HortTube. My name is John Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays. Next Sunday will be a subscriber Sunday where subscribers send in photos of things in their garden that they're proud of. Uh, so you can send photos to the HortTube at Gmail uh, email address right here on the screen. And uh, please, uh, if you would, turn your phone sideways if you're taking photos with your phone so that you know YouTube is a widescreen format. Also, uh, just send like one, one really good photo. If you put like six photos in an email, then, then the, uh, Gmail downsizes the, uh, the photos and then they don't fill up the screen. So they're not the best quality photos at that point. So just pick a good one. Uh, the other thing is uh, I'd love some photos that are pollinator related. So if you have a pollinator garden that still has bees or butterflies or whatever in it, I'd love to have some of those photos. I may use those photos in another video. So if you're sending those in, you may see them twice. Uh, so thank you guys for participating in that. And also the question, garden question and answer videos. If you have gardening questions, you can ask them down below as well, but it will be two weeks before there's another Q and A. Uh, I think that's it on that subject. Um, I was actually in Kansas City uh, for four days this past week. So by the time you guys saw the Q and A with, Steph from, uh, with Stephanie from last Sunday, uh, I was already taken off to Kansas City and went to a garden center uh, owners meeting and I was there representing the Southern Living Plant Collection and Encore Azaleas at that meeting and I did not take the camera uh, which you know I frequently don't at those kinds of meetings um, um, but I enjoy going and meeting with uh, friends from across the country so that event is uh, fun every fall and uh, uh, I went to two garden centers uh, no went, went to five garden centers uh, went to two family tree garden centers two suburban um, uh, suburban home and suburban home and garden uh locations and uh colonial and also went to hallmark as well on wednesday Bus very busy day touring things on wednesday beautiful garden centers uh anybody uh, that's uh goes to the gets to shop at those in kansas city what a great place of course there's great barbecue in kansas city so i just had a good overall week uh hanging out with friends there i think the sun is right on my head right this second but it'll go away in a minute Okay, so uh, Kansas City was fun. I think you'll see a large shrub video at this point and a medium shrub video at this point, and I've got more of those, still more of those coming. A great tour video that I've, uh, I've not gotten edited yet. I didn't do a whole lot of editing while I was on the road either. And uh, some other things uh, coming up this week. So let's get started on some questions, and uh, I'll repeat the, uh, the information about uh, sending in photos at the end of the video. Somebody has their calla lilies aren't blooming. They're in zone six, so they're digging them and storing them inside every year. Um, there's a whole lot, <laughs> whole lot of reasons that they would come up and have foliage and no, and no flowers. And it could be as simple as, you know, they're underwatering them. Uh, they're not in enough sunlight uh, because mine are in probably a little more shade over here than they'd want to be. And it does have bigger foliage than normal and it's last, last a little longer. Uh, into the season looking good. It did flower, but probably not as much as it would if I had it out in a little more sun. So that could be an issue. And dormancy could also be an issue. They need to go absolutely dormant in the winter time. So if they're being stored in the house, it's possible that they're not getting enough cold treatment. So uh, lots of different things could be going on there. And, and again, I'm just getting a question and then guessing. So those are some of my guesses. Uh, all right. Uh, somebody said, uh, asked me, um, I've talked about I don't plant uh, many grasses going into uh, fall this time of year. And the only reason I always say that is because I landscaped for years and I was guaranteeing plants that I was planting. And I noticed a pattern of any time we were doing landscape installations in the fall that the following spring, a lot of the grasses weren't coming back up. And so uh, we have a clay based soil here. It might be a little different if you're in a sandy area where it drains a little better in the winter time. But our, um, you know, things can get end up overwatered here in the winter and it's a dormant grass. It didn't have time to get anchored in the ground. So it's just sitting in a bowl, uh, basically. And I think that's, you know, that's what's going on there. If you, you know, spring planted the exact same grass. Uh, and then they were asking if that would include native grasses like blue stem. Yeah, it included all grasses. Any grasses that I were putting in, I noticed uh, that didn't mean they all died. So, you know, again, it's, you know, plant at your own risk. I just always... Um, 
thought that they're best spring planted because it gives them a whole season to root in. And then once they're rooted in like that, they're almost unkillable. Um, you know, a lot of our native and non-native ornamental grasses, uh, you know, can anchor themselves in, uh, in quite well. I would put, you know, grass-like plants uh, in, you know, liriope wouldn't be a problem. It stays evergreen in the wintertime. Uh, uh, Carexes, you know, wouldn't be a problem in the wintertime. So anything in the lily family or the, you know, or other um, uh, uh, graminoids like juncus or carex, you know, I might put in. But the grasses that go completely dormant, that's kind of the ones I'm talking about. So uh, again, it's more of a just pointing out that when, back when I had to guarantee plants, that seemed like a disproportionate. I didn't have to replace a lot of plants. I mean, we did a pretty good job, I thought, overall. But that was one thing. Any kind of fall installations I was doing, I'd be like, we'll come back in the spring and plant the grasses. Or, you know, I'd tell them we're not guaranteeing the grasses. Okay, uh, somebody has three weeping willows planted in their landscape. And uh, uh, they're about 40 feet apart. But they have a sidewalk near one of them and a foundation near one of them. And they have a septic tank. Wanted to know if there was concern over the roots on weeping willows. They are very aggressive rooting. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, the kind of space, you know, how far away from these uh, things they are. But I, the one thing that would worry me would be the septic tank. Probably not that worried about the foundation and, you know, in a modern house and, you know, probably not going to hurt the sidewalk for some long, long period of time before that would take place. It could hurt them both, but it would just take, you know, a long, long, long time. Most likely the willow, the, the roots will get to the foundation and then turn down the side and, you know, just kind of hug along the foundation is, is what I've seen uh, from other trees. But um, your septic tank is the, you know, the real problem. I mean, that thing, you know, can quickly, uh, if it finds that septic tank, it'll just run as far as it can through, uh, through those lines. Um, and I've had uh, landscape jobs in the past where, you know, we got into a job and then had to call in someone to, uh, you know, to pull the roots out of uh, a drain field. And if you've ever seen that, where roots go down one of those, uh, one of those pipes in a, in a drain field, it will fill the entire drainage pipe up all the way out into the field, you know, like 30 or 40 feet, 50 feet long. It's really kind of wild. You can probably find videos on it, but there are videos on it on YouTube of pulling roots out of a septic field. It, uh, once it finds it, it will take full advantage of all those nutrients in your waste. Okay, uh, so the one near the septic field would be the one I would be con most concerned about. Uh, so do, somebody asked me, do I always raise my plants up? I'm wondering if I'm just, like, half my head is blown out here probably okay um do i always raise my plants up they were specifically planting a butterfly bush wanted to know if i raised all the plants that i plant up i raise everything up that i'm planting for several different reasons number one mainly uh again my clay based soil here uh when we're planting things here you think of it you're digging basically a clay pot an inverted clay pot into the ground and then you're putting this organic ball in the middle of it so water can just fall into it uh, very easily. So I make sure that crown is well up above where that water could be. So that's one reason. The second reason everybody should mount stuff up just a bit is because you've loosened some of the soil under the plant as well in the ground and so there's going to be some settling. So if you leave a plant up about two inches you can expect it to fall back into that hole at least an inch uh, no matter what. So there will be some settling of all that soil because you're not going to recompact it as much as you know it was before you started the project so uh, you know that's the second reason uh, for leaving things up also i'm going to mulch the bed after i plant the plant so if i plant it flush i'm immediately burying the plant in mulch uh, or creating some sort of cup around it where i'm not mulching so i'm le i'm really i'm leaving them elevated so i don't drown them and i'm leaving them elevated uh, because to compensate I'm double leaving them up to compensate for some settling. And then I'm leaving some space for my mulch. And so, you know, I want them up just a little bit. So yes, I do mound everything up. If you're in more sandy, you know, a soil that drains better, or if you're in the desert, you know, mounding plants may not make as much sense because, you know, it's gonna, they require a little bit more water, especially initially when they're mounted up uh, just a bit. But I'm, I'm, really, I'm doing that for, like I say, there's a lot of different reasons for it. So, but that's the reason, and yes, I leave everything elevated just a bit. And then 
when, by the time I finish mulching and I mulch up, you know, to that elevation or slightly higher, then you can't tell it was elevated anyway. Okay. Uh, so somebody treated their lawn for grubs. Um, I don't know what they treated their lawn with. I have no idea. I'm whatever chemical or whatever. Um, and then they're putting in some new beds and then they found, and they're using, they're going to use some wood chips in the beds and still finding grubs uh, and what to do about that. I think you'll end up with less grubs in your new bed spaces, just re regardless. So, uh, you know, most of those, especially Japanese beetle grubs, like turf and sunny spaces. I've said this several times before. You'll find a few in the beds, but you'll find far less in the beds typically than you do in lawn areas. So I think you'll end up with less overall uh, regardless. And, uh, you know, I don't know what to say about what you treated it with and why you still have them. But, uh, you know, probably going to be an ongoing uh, issue if you still have other lawn areas. And keep in mind, I mean, it's... The chemical's temporary. I don't know what kind of chemical you used. I mean, there are some natural, uh, what is it called? Oh, I'm not going to remember it right now. The grub treatment that you can use that kills um, milky spore. Okay, you can get, I don't know if you treated it with milky spore, because that probably takes a long time to actually work. But if you treat it with an actual chemical, that chemical's not going to last very long. And you had new Japanese beetles this year laying new, um, you know, doing their thing again. So that would be the reason you just have them right back. You're never going to, you're not going to cure it completely uh, with any strategy other than, you know, elim eliminating lawn and, tr and planting shade trees so that you can shade, shade the ground because you make, a, you make spaces where they're not, you know, that are not ideal spaces for grubs, for Japanese beetle grubs. Okay. Uh, another question was somebody has Bermuda grass and clay soil, I don't think that really matters all that much here. Uh, and they wanted to know, they're gonna create some new beds uh, that they're planting in next spring. Wanted to know about how to go about killing that Bermuda. This was down in Texas. Uh, I rarely ever recommend anybody spray anything. You guys know that, but Bermuda grass might be the exception uh, to that because even if you bury it in cardboard, even if you bury it in 12 inches of, of, uh, of wood chips, uh, you know, even if you bury it in clear, pla you put clear plastic down and let the sun cook it for a month. And when you pull it back up, some of it's coming back. <laughs> it's just one of those just nightmare things. And one, stra the strategy I used here, okay, because there was some Bermuda grass mixed in, is I shaved it off to the ground, okay, and then with the lawnmower, I mean, just mowed it as low as I could go. And just, I, I, I worked it down slowly. I didn't go right to the lowest setting on the lawnmower. I did it over several days and then I buried the place in wood chips pretty deep and almost none of it came back except that there's a spot of it right there I've been thinking about making a video about it because it's eating a Veronica and I'm gonna have to tear my Veronica out in order to get that last piece of Bermuda grass out of this bed space but it's the only piece that I have left so I was able to get rid of most of it using that technique uh, but I think down in if you had a lot of Bermuda grass, it might, if this had been all Bermuda, I'd have probably looked at it differently, but it's just, it was small patches of Bermuda and I went about it the way I went about it. And again, I still have a little bit, but overall I got rid of most of it. If you followed what I just said, you can probably get rid of 99% of it. Probably something's going to pop up and that, that might be, and that might be the best strategy. Rather than spray the whole thing, why not take the, scalp it down, put the wood chips in place, uh, mid to late next spring if it starts popping up in a couple spots spray it then and then it would be a lot less chemical overall with some sort of um, with some sort of herbicide again i don't recommend spraying stuff it's just that bermuda grass is the worst uh, of all you know probably the most noxious weed of all the noxious weeds uh, honestly uh, anywhere anywhere it grows it outcompetes everything um, and that's just what it does. Let's see, somebody got some Camellia Sasanqua seedlings uh, from somebody wanting to know if they would plant them this time of year in zone 7B. <sighs> They're better off in the ground than they are. I mean, Camellias are hardy in seven to nine typically. Some are hardy up into zone six. These seedlings are not likely one of those. They're probably hardy in zone seven to nine. So they're marginally hardy and these are small plants and it's fall. Typically, I would say not to plant them, but un unfortunately in those containers, they're even more vulnerable. 
So I'd probably plant them and then I'd take a one gallon, I'd take a, like a one or a three gallon container and I'd turn it upside down on top of them when it was colder during the uh, winter time, maybe put some leaves around the pot to keep the pot from blowing away and use that strategy for protecting them during the winter. Keep the pots off of them any day that's above freezing. But if it's going to be, you know, low 20s, teens, that kind of thing, uh, just take a three gallon container, put it up on top of them, bury it in some leaves, and that should give it plenty of protection uh, to survive the winter. Be better off than in the container. Uh, so there you go. Let's see. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so oh, somebody asked me when to move a uh, Wedding blush hydrangea, that's a hydrangea macrophylla. Any, I get lots of questions about when to move things. When that thing's dormant, you can move it easily. You could probably move it now as it's going to sleep as well. Uh, any hydrangea mac are, are, are pretty easy uh, to move when, when dormant. Okay, somebody, zone six. Okay, all right, here's a good question. So they're in zone six, they happen to be in zone six, but they're actually north of Chicago. They just happen to be on Lake Michigan. And so, uh, it's a little warmer there and it's a little spot on the map where they happen to be in zone six just because their average low temperature doesn't fall uh, as low because of the lake itself. And they wanted to know about growing zone six things that they don't see there. Uh, I think part of the reason that you don't see the zone six things there uh, has less. So this is, okay, so I've talked about the zone map having some built-in issues and this is one of them. Uh, you're, the length of the, um, sometimes it's not about how low the temperature goes. Your, my 30 degrees and your 30 degrees are obviously the same, right? They're both 30 degrees. But your days are almost probably an hour and a half shorter than mine, maybe two hours shorter than mine in the wintertime. And so that means your 30 degrees can last another extra two hours than mine or, you know, maybe three hours longer than mine. And, you're, in, and your days being shorter, the ground is going to, uh, the ground temperature overall is going to be colder. So even though our nighttime, our, you know, the nighttime temperatures in zone six there versus zone six in Long Island or zone six, that's not a good example because, you know, that's pretty far north as well. But that's one of the issues is the day length and the number of hours that you're going to stay below freezing uh, becomes, becomes an issue and not just that absolute number of the average low temperature that you typically have. And so that's why you don't see some of the leafy evergreen things that might be hardy in zone six or, you know, uh, uh, it's worth a try. Anything's worth a try for sure. Um, I mean, why not order something if you can get something in a small container and try it like an abelia or something like that that's zone six hardy. It's just my feeling is, is that with the reduction in daylight in the winter time, it's tougher in your area despite the temperature being slightly moderated because of the lake. Um, that's likely what you're seeing and missing some of the plants that you might see uh, that are zone six hardy uh, on the internet or whatever. Okay, so somebody's doing my favorite thing ever. Uh, they're removing an oak tree. Uh, I don't know if the oak tree's sick or whatever. I don't know why they're removing the oak tree. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't be critical of it, but anyway, uh, and they're planting uh, crepe, my favorite crepe myrtles and a rose of Sharon uh, and wanted to know they don't have time to plant the crepe myrtle and the rose of Sharon, how to overwinter them. The rose of Sharon, you can just park your car on for the winter time. You're probably not going to kill it. And the crepe myrtles don't like their roots frozen solid. So probably for me, I'm going to take the crepe myrtles, put them pot to pot, maybe some pile some leaves up on them in a, in a corner somewhere and just pile, you know, pile some leaves up around them and just keep the pots from freezing solid. The top of the plant's fine. Uh, so you don't have to worry about protecting the top of a dormant tree that has no leaves on it, but you need to prevent those roots from freezing solid. So that was our problem growing crepe myrtles here in zone seven in a nursery setting, was that they're above ground in the winter and those roots are extremely vulnerable. Below about 15 degrees, it'll just kill roots on, the, on those crepe myrtles, maybe 12, 12, 15 degrees, something like that. Just kills the roots in the pot uh, and then they're, hard to take, take a long time to recover from that uh, so just put them in a corner pot to pot pile some leaves around them and uh and then plant another oak i mean you know get rid of your oak and then plant your crepe myrtle and your rose of sharon okay i'm being you guys know you guys know i don't like crepe myrtles that all that much um 
And that's literally, this person might, they didn't say where they lived and I figured it was in my neighborhood because that's what people do here. Let's see, uh, growing, uh, somebody wants to know about growing tomatoes and peppers indoors under grow lights in the winter time. I don't think your grow lights are strong enough to grow tomatoes and peppers. I mean, we have, you know, the reason there's a short, very short window of time like even here in North Carolina where it's, you know, the, you know, hot and the sun is, you know, very high in the sky, even now, you know, very high in the sky, well into September. Uh, it, they take a lot of sunlight. They're, you know, these are plants that are native to around the equator. So, um, you know, they take a tremendous amount of light. So uh, I don't, and they, you know, tomatoes are vining. So they're gonna have to get, you know, they're gonna wanna get bigger all winter long. Maybe you could, you just need extremely bright grow lights to grow, uh, tomato, keep tomatoes and peppers. What they were trying to do was take cuttings off their tomatoes and peppers and keep the cuttings through the winter rather than restarting them from seed every year. Makes sense. Um, I just think that it's going to be, uh, take a tremendous amount of light and if they drop below the amount of light that they need, they're gonna become stressed and then spider mites are going to attack them. And anybody who's tried to grow anything tropical inside through the winter and doesn't give them enough light knows exactly what I mean. Spider mites will try to destroy them. Okay, let's see. Where were we? Okay. Um, so, okay, somebody has their county sprays for mosquitoes, and they wanted to know how that was going to affect their vegetable garden. I don't know what your county, I don't know what the county is spraying. This was in eastern Georgia and wet area, and I don't know what they're spraying. So, obviously, if they were spraying malathion or, you know, some sort of insecticide like that, uh, synthetic insecticide, insecticide like that then obviously you know that would have a negative impact on at least the pollinators that were on your uh, you know that were pollinating your vegetables uh if nothing else uh you'd have to you know but that's a that would be a contact chemical so it could be washed off the fruit it would just have a negative impact on the uh on the actual pollinators my guess is if they're pl sp they're spraying from a plane and they're spraying over wet areas, they're probably spraying something like BTI, which is a uh, larvicide that kills the larva for the, um, uh, for the mosquitoes. This has been used for a long, long time in Europe and, and here as well. And people, you know, proclaim it's, you know, proclaim it's safety because it just kills, you know, larva. But that group of, uh, that group that mosquitoes are included in also include things like midges, uh, which are little wingless looking mosquitoes that you see around the water. Those little, those little small shrimpy looking things. It's basically, it looks like a mosquito, but it doesn't have, uh, doesn't have wings. Uh, it kills the larva of those as well. And those happen to be the base, you know, of the food, you know, that things like, uh, uh, amphibians eat in the base of the food web. And so, uh, you know, you can tell me that, you know, oh, we have a natural. It's natural. It's natural. It must be great. It must be safe because it says natural, right? Everything has a negative consequence. You know, you, if you spray it from a plane, uh, my guess is, is that, my guess is that's probably what they're using. And it does have a negative consequence on our environment, but not your vegetable garden. So that, to answer your question, if that's what they're using, but you can probably ask the county what it is they're spraying from the thing are they spraying in synthetic insecticide if so then you know that's going to have definitely have a negative impact on lots of things that would pollinate your vegetable garden but the vegetables can be washed off you know and you know that's the kind of insect that are sprayed on vegetables anyway that you're buying from you know that you're buying from grocery stores if they're not organic but they're the kind that can be washed off you know of the produce and they're not uh, systemic. They're not inside the vegetable itself. Uh, they're just on the uh, outside of it. But they do have obviously a negative consequence to everything else. The uh, unintended consequences to everything else. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, somebody planted some Shindo viburnum in April and they couldn't keep up with the watering. And I can imagine so because this has been very dry, very dry. When I was in Kansas City this week, it had been dry for them all year. Uh, some people are flooding and other people are very, very dry. This is the year we've had. Uh, and they got very thin, so they lost their interior foliage. And I've said that many times. That's a good way to kind of figure out, diagnose how, you know, what was going wrong. If you're losing a lot of interior leaves, that's too dry, typically. And uh, so that's what they've seen. And so 
and they wanted to know what to do. Nothing. Leave it be. Uh, let them get established. Let them get rooted in. Once you start seeing some positive growth on them next year, maybe even the year after, uh, then you can start to do a little bit of shearing on them once or twice to get them to fill back in a bit in the interior. But in the meantime, leave it alone. Um, don't think about it and uh, they'll, they'll recover. What all the plant did was put itself back in balance with the roots under the ground. And it's done that, it succeeded. It could not support 100% of the leaves on the top with the roots that it had on the bottom and it put itself in balance. So it did, it did what it needed to do, it'll be fine. It'll take a little while for it to start growing. Shindo viburnum, are, I've said it before, slow about getting started growing anyway. But once they get it going and you can see they're happy again, just tip prune them just a bit all the way around. Take an inch off the end of every branch if you can, that you can reach and that'll help fill it back in. Okay, somebody asked me um, about planting a fig this time of year. I don't know where, I get a lot of questions. I don't, there was a lot of questions this week without uh, the zone you live in and you know, uh, a little, sometimes that is helpful in answering the question. So I don't know what zone you live in. If you're planting a fig in zone 8B or 9 or 10, you could plant it 12 months out of the year without any problem. If you're planting one in zone 7 here, where I'm at, they grow great. There's one right on the other side of these screening plants that you can't see, and there's one behind the camera back over there. Uh, they grow great, but they're one of those things I kind of like to spring plant just because winter, the first winter can be tough on them. Uh, until they've got some caliper on them. Uh, and then they wanted to know the light conditions. Full sun. I mean, in almost every edible plant, uh, you can kind of head toward full sun unless you live way, way, way south. Um, but for the most part, uh, most of us, most of you watching the channel, almost anything you're planting that's edible needs way more than a half a day sun. Okay. Um, so somebody had landscaping that was installed back in 2004 in the state of Texas. And now the plants are kind of out of control. Some of the perennials are not where they were originally planted. And uh, they have a spirea, uh, I think it was Anthony Water or spirea, that's just a big giant mound at this point. That's about, now I usually say that when we're, when you're talking about ornamental landscaping, when we're talking about the kind of landscaping where everything's got to be, you know, it's perfect little balls and you know, the type of landscaping that you see on most houses, most of those plants going in, except for the trees, hopefully the trees are spaced well enough that you don't have to worry about this with trees, but most of the shrubs kind of have a, a time limit uh, where they either need to be cut really hard back to the ground or replaced. And so, you know, it usually is somewhere around 20 years. Before I left the old house, that's kind of what I was in the process of doing there didn't get very far into that project before I pulled the rug out from under it and confused people and moved up here. But um, that landscape was about 20 years old when I started taking things back, taking, deciding to take some things out and replace some things. And so it's not abnormal. And in Texas, it's probably even, you know, it's hotter and it's tougher conditions on plants. And so something like your Anthony Water or Spirea, you can completely reset. So you can cut that thing down in the winter time to 18 inches tall, get, pull out and, and, and remove any suckers that are around it where it's kind of become a colony and just reset the thing. It'll come right back up out of that. Some of the perennials that have moved to places that you don't want them, you can pop them out of the ground while they're dormant and put them back where they were. So it's not like you're completely restarting, but I would expect a tired looking landscape after 18 or 20 years um, if you weren't, you know, resetting things, cutting things back hard occasionally, uh, and or replacing a few things here or there uh, to refresh it. Um, I, I don't think it's unexpected. Uh, I talked about, Steph and I talked about uh, replacements for boxwoods for a little formal hedge uh, last week. And of course, there were a couple other suggestions down at the bottom of that video if you want to go back and look. And you know, we're, we're not going to think of everything when you're sitting there. I threw the question out and both of us went back and forth with a few things that were good. And then somebody said, ask if uh, Lanicera uh, nit <laughs> nitida uh, is a good replacement. Yes, absolutely. And there's three new ones coming from the Southern Living Plant Collection that I'll be talking about next year. Uh, and I have a variegated one in the front garden. So there'll be four of those and I'll talk more about them. I'll talk more about them next year. And then somebody, um, 
last question for this week. Somebody asked uh, about a hosta for more sun. They wanted hostas for more sun. There are, if you would just Google a uh, fragrant plantain lily, uh, there, there, and, and, and buy those. Uh, those are the ones that will take uh, more sun. They're larger growing and they need a little more sun to put up those big uh, fragrant flowers. Uh, but even still, they don't necessarily want 15 hours of sun a day, but there are a few, there are a few that are a little bit, a little bit more sun tolerant than others. What you'll want to avoid is the yellow variegations and the white variegations. Those tend to really get stung in more than five or six hours of direct, direct sunlight. And the whiter they are, probably the more shade uh, they actually need uh, to not get burned during the winter. So there you go. Uh, thank you guys for participating. I don't know how many questions that was this week, 18 or 19, 20, something like that. So thank you. Uh, again, send photos to the horttube at gmail.com email address. And uh, if you can include some pollinator photos, I'd actually like to put up uh, some other video and I might use those photos in some other ways as well. When I do consultations with folks now, uh, it's, it's kind of fun to see that I've had some impact in that regard. It's something that folks are, are going for in their landscapes. And uh, uh, I, I really, uh, uh, that really has, has motivated me more uh, you know, it's something that I was going to do regardless. You know, I just didn't know that a lot of you would follow along. You know, thanks for following along with it. Uh, that that it's something that's important to you as well, and you're looking at your your landscape or your garden as as part of nature uh, because it is part of nature, and uh, uh, and that, that the flaws in it are, are okay, and those flaws are part of nature. Uh, as well. So I'd love to see some of those uh, photos that include pollinator plants or pollinators themselves, whatever. Thank you guys for watching.